welcome to Hour 1 of Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. It is local talk radio in Fairbanks, Alaska on 660 on your AM dial. But we are streaming live around the world at KFAR660.com. And we are also available on your smartphone if your phone is smart by downloading the free TuneIn Radio app. I am Steve Floyd, simply the man with the face made for radio, the monkey behind the machine. Joining us in the studio today, as always, we've got Josh Bennett. Hello. Bighorn Enterprises. Now, Josh, you're... Good yeah, morning. You're kind of the uh, the brains of the operation. I say kind of because if you added up all the brains in the room, <laughs> I mean, we might still be a little short. We'd be shy. But if we added up who's on the phone right now, we'd be far ahead. I oh, yeah. And we have a couple of special guests calling in this morning. Yeah, we got uh, Jeff Berwick, a multiple guest. He's been on several times, always gracious enough to get out of his busy schedule and... Ken Carpenter, I believe, today. They're going to talk to us about Galt's Galt's Chile. Hey, guys, are you there? We got this there. Uh, Ken, are you there? Yes, uh, sir. And, uh, Jeff, sir. are you there? Yes, my chihuahuas are going crazy. I'm just getting them kicked out of my house or my room. But, uh, yes, I am here. They're getting excited. We're trying to get our chihuahuas after. kicked out of our head here at the same time. <laughs> I always have, It seems like I always have chihuahuas running around in my head. I don't know what it is, just this constant yapping noise. All right, uh, Josh, take it away. Um, first, uh, Ken, could you uh, give us a little background of what, who you are and uh, what you're doing with Galtz? Are you in Chile right now? Yes, I am. Right on. All right. Well, if you'll take it and then uh, bring Jeff Berwick in on it also. And you guys, this is your this is your forum, so give us the details. Let us know what's going on down there. We're excited about it. For uh, good morning in Alaska. So, uh, Gulch Gulch is a uh, is a somewhat of a sustainable community development, and we're helping to bring people down to have a vacation home or a second residence, or possibly relocate their families to uh, different areas in Chile where we can uh, grow lots of different qualities, varieties of crops. Uh, we have a super water supply that's unmolested, and uh, it's a beautiful setting as well. It's a Mediterranean climate, so uh, we feel like we have a, a great opportunity to, to help people if they feel like they would like to, to live in a different area, maybe under a different type of uh, system that they live under now. Uh, we That's what we're offering in Gulf Gulch. Right on. And some of that uh, is, uh, you were saying something about, you know, vacation homes or people that want to move. I think... Some of that, from what we talk about here, is actually expatriation, getting out of the USSA and somewhere more free. You know, it's really interesting, and I think, Jeff, you've been a great example to me, for one, and lots of people that follow you. The uh, the mainstream, you know, if you live in America, you're in the greatest country in the world, and if you watch the media, if you go to Mexico, it's all gang warfare and drug warfare everyone's killing each other and it doesn't matter what other country it is i haven't heard there hasn't been a media process against chile yet but i'm sure it'll come if people start moving out of here to go to there but could you guys tell us a little bit about what chile is like compare it just compare it to the united states the business environment the government environment unfortunately they do have a government but that's it's all right some of them aren't as bad as ours. Yeah, I think Ken can uh, comment quite a bit on the Chilean uh, business climate it's, and the government as well. Uh, he's lived down there for the last five years and it's definitely different. I can obviously comment on the U.S. government and Canadian government uh, and how bad they are and we've talked about that many times before but uh, I think Ken can uh, really uh, let you know a, bit, a little bit about what, how it's so much different down in Chile. Hi guys. Um, the Chilean economy, like, uh, like you said, is is doing really well. Uh, they they run a really low national uh, deficit, almost, and they offset that with copper revenues. So uh, ideally, those would those copper mines would be owned by private private companies. But uh, the revenues that come from the copper help offset some of the things, and and uh, most of the taxation is done through a VAT tax, which is a consumer tax. Uh, so time deposits and uh, CDs pay a, pay a nice yield to 6 to 8% here in Chile so people can actually get rewarded for saving their money in a bank. Uh, there's a lot of freedoms that uh, 
the Chileans have, they probably take for granted. About 50% of the schools are private schools. Uh, they were in a voucher system that was set up for a Chicago School of Economics team back in the oh, these are late 80s. Uh, the school buses are private. The highways are all private. So you just pay tolls and you get a lot of hours and weekends. You'll pay higher tolls for bridges and tunnels. Uh, but the, they're good service. All these private services are offered really well, and, and they have the quality with those services, or people will use them. They'll find other, they'll find other things, and and the companies will be replaced. So, yeah, that's excellent. I didn't realize that the highways a lot of there. Freedoms that, uh, and even the uh, uh, firefighters are uh, in, in Santiago, at least, are voluntary. They're volunteer firefighters. So a lot of the questions that a lot of the uh, statists have about, oh, how would we have roads without the government? How would we have firefighters? How would we have schools? Uh, a lot of those, a lot of Americans, have unfortunately, have forgotten that all those things used to be private in the U.S., uh, but they haven't been for decades, and that's why a lot of people have forgotten. But thanks to Chile, it was communist about 30 years ago, and they really, uh, they kind of just had enough of it, obviously, uh, after everything started to fall apart. They used to do quite well before it was communist, and then they went communist, and it just turned into a disaster. And, and they smartly, there's only about, I think the population of Chile is, what is it, Ken, 14 million? Is that right? 14 million? But I think, yeah, I think it's around 14 million. Mm -hmm. Seven to f oh, how much? Uh, regarding the uh, firefighters, Jeff, uh, yeah. the firefighters, they, they start as apprentices uh, when they're 10 or 11 years old. Uh, so they'll just be hanging around the fire station, and, and they apprentice their whole life to, to aspire to be that. And then they keep a full-time job, so they might be a taxi driver, and then I'll notice the taxi driver has a little medallion in the window that he's a... He's a volunteer firefighter, but it's the whole country, Jeff. It's the, the whole country of Chile. They're very proud of uh, the bomberos are all volunteers. Yeah, it's fantastic. And you can really see the difference in the culture uh, when it, a lot of these things are privatized. Uh, there's a lot more respect. There's a lot more uh, people are just generally happier. Um, unfortunately, Americans have forgotten uh, a lot of the free market principles upon which uh, the U.S. was generally founded. and it really changes the culture and it's, it's really unfortunate that uh, if you talk to your average American today they will say oh the Soviet Union was a disaster because it was communist because they centrally planned the economy well the US uh, economy right now is centrally planned by the Federal Reserve uh, it's also centrally planned by the government with all sorts of regulations and taxes and and all sorts of uh, involvement in the economy and then all sorts of things like firefighters, police, roads, uh, they're all centrally planned in the U.S. Uh, most of the tenets of communism actually uh, the U.S. adheres to and so it's really fantastic to be in a place like Chile where they have uh, turned away from a lot of that. It's not completely perfect of course uh, but it's much much better and probably not going to get a lot worse anytime soon because it's doing so fantastically well. I, I compare Santiago, I, I call it the uh, Hong Kong of South America. Uh, it's just booming. Uh, there's nothing but uh, cranes on every, almost every street in Santiago building new roads, um, or sorry, building new buildings. Uh, it's just doing fantastically well and I can't see them turning away from it anytime soon. I've actually had people ask me that Whenever I bring up Chile, they say, oh, they had a dictator just, you know, within a couple of decades, Pinochet, and, and uh, I said, yeah, that's gone. And I agree with what you're saying. When people are getting a taste of that freedom and their standard of living going up, why would they want to go back? Yeah, it's also attracting people from around the world. Every time I go down there, I'm, I'm amazed at how many uh, foreigners are there. Uh, every time I go, I meet uh, Argentines. A lot of Argentines are moving to Chile, obviously, because Argentina has gone almost full commie now, and never go full commie. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, a lot of uh, um, Venezuelans um, and many Americans, Canadians, all people from around the world, they seem to be hearing about it now. So it's really um, an incredibly interesting time to get involved in Chile because uh, n not everyone has realized what's going on there. They don't realize, when a lot of people think about South America, they don't even know much about Chile. But Chile is the only country in South America that's really gone very capitalist and very free market. Uh, not in entirely, but very free market. So uh, it's really uh, an, an amazing opportunity to get into Chile because a lot of things like property prices haven't risen to really high levels yet. It's definitely more expensive than uh, uh, probably any country in South America in general terms. 
Uh, definitely, if you spend some time in Santiago, and especially if you go to some nice restaurants, you'll see that the prices are not cheap. Uh, but it's not overly expensive yet. Uh, it's not in incredibly expensive, especially because their central bank isn't Keynesian. They're actually uh, adherents to the uh, Chicago School or Freedmanites. So they don't print a lot of money. And even when, when they do, and Ken can talk to this, uh, they actually track the inflation. Actually, uh, every year they adjust for the inflation automatically. And um, Ken can uh, uh, speak about that. Uh, the things Jeff were mentioning, the uh, inflation-adjusted amount uh, is something called a, a UF. It's a formatted unit of currency. If, uh, like, for example, today I think it's about 22,000 pesos. The 22,000 pesos uh, is when all your contracts for, for um, health insurance, life insurance, different types of policies, uh, definitely with real estate and land development, uh, this UF gives you a price that moves with inflation, so they have to publish it. Uh, they they publish it daily. Uh, it runs like a ticker on the stock market here. It's uh, you on all the banks' web pages, and uh, the UTM and the UF are the two two gauges. They will be able to tell you how much inflation the government is. So it's uh, good for investing. It's it's definitely a good thing. You can actually plan ahead. That's a, yeah, that's a yeah, different it's not, it's concept. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's better. It's, a, it's definitely no, uh, no central bank is the best, and actually having the market actually uh, ha control the money or actually the people control the money, something like gold or silver or Bitcoin is much better, obviously. But if you're going to have a central bank, uh, this is a much better style. And uh, the Chicago School, of course, is much closer to the Austrian school than the Keynesians. The Keynesians are on another planet compared to Austrians <laughs> in Chicago School. Uh, they, they actually believe that, or I don't know if they believe it or not, I'm, I don't know if they're evil or stupid, but they actually think that if you print a lot of money, it helps the economy. And I think uh, people in Zimbabwe can tell you that that doesn't appear to be the case. I think we're going to find out for ourselves in the States here. I, which is worse, having a stupid evil person or a smart evil person? <laughs> and that's, I, I'm trying to figure out which is, which is worse. That's a good question. Um, let me think about that question. <laughs> stupid evil person or a smart evil person? Uh, I think stupid evil would be better. Um, because if you're a really smart evil, well, it, I'm not sure if they're stupid or evil. I just I can't figure it out. Because every single thing that the Federal Reserve does and every single thing that the U.S. government does destroys the economy. Um, so I, it's, it's almost like when you, get, when you have a track record of every single thing you do for decades is the exact opposite of what you should be doing if you actually want the country or the U.S. or the area to succeed, uh, you have to at some point uh, think that they must be doing this on purpose. And there was actually a, a, uh, a, a cartoon in the Chicago Tribune in 1934, and I forget the, what it exactly said, but it basically said, if you want to destroy an economy, first print a lot of money, institute all kinds of regulations, uh, destroy the economy, then ins institute a dictatorship, and then uh, blame it all on capitalism. And that was in the Chicago Tribune, Tribune in 1934, which is an interesting time, right after the uh, Great Depression had happened, right after gold confiscation. So uh, these central bankers, these uh, financial elite and political elites, I'm not sure if they're doing it on purpose or not, but their track record seems to indicate if they're not doing it on purpose, they've been incredibly lucky at doing every single thing to destroy the economy for decades now. I think that it would be a, a, a very good argument could be made that the Federal Reserve is evil and that the people in government are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you've actually talked with many people who run for office, but I think most people who are in <laughs> office or who run for office are just plain... Stupid. Stupid. Let's go back to Chile. Yeah. What's, it, what's, what's the government like there? You said it's not communist. Do people vote for their representation? Do they go out in town hall meetings? How do they, how do they, do they, do they think that laws are something that can be created out of thin air? Um, you can take, yeah, I can answer that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, the, they're a pretty similar system to uh, the representatives, you know, democratically elected. Uh, but the taxation is much different since so many things are privatized and not under the government umbrella. Uh, for example, you, you can go down the street and uh, a private business will, will let you in or whatever, but they, they, will, they do have contracted on the streets of Santiago bathrooms that are uh, 
open to the public, but you pay. <clears throat> you pay equivalent of like 60 cents, and you go in, the bathroom is super clean, it's nice. It, it's open to all the public, but they have an attendant there, and it's, it's cleaned all the time. Uh, these, these things are private, and they're just, you know, they're not a tax suck. You know, they're, they're paid by use. And I just think that's a, a little better system. As far as uh, the politics, I really don't pay attention to them. I just think there's too many productive things to do. That I just don't, I don't even really uh, watch the politics in Chile. After 40 years, uh, uh, the worst of socialism and communism and uh, uh, an oppressive dictatorship, uh, a lot of human rights were, were uh, abused and people fled the country. So those generations all remember it. You know, there's three generations alive that remember that, those times really well of any politician, of what anybody says. Yeah, it should also be pointed out that um, in the government itself, and I don't like any government, obviously, but uh, many of the people in government are actually uh, big followers of Ayn Rand. And, and of course, Galt Gulch is named after uh, Ayn Rand's book, Alice Shrugged. And uh, many of them are actually adherents and are believers in that sort of philosophy, not necessarily objectivism, but in, in terms of freedom. And uh, so it's a very interesting place. And we'll see what happens. Uh, I think there's an election coming up. I'm not sure what's going to happen. And maybe Ken can comment on that. I don't know if he even pays attention. He's sort of like me. He doesn't even want to bother himself with politics. But uh, the current government, uh, is, uh, many people are really uh, libertarian. Or can you have anything to add on that? Uh, just, well, you, you had the evil, stupid person or smart, evil person, whatever it was. There's a, <clears throat> a poet in uh, Peru who said he was looking at the choices for president last year, and he said, well, it's like choosing between cancer and AIDS. So I kind of follow his, his route. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. I had read that, too. I think... Uh, I don't know what they call him, if it's the Chile's finance minister, I believe, or I don't know, that he was uh, held a pretty, I don't know if it's the current one or a past one, they held the uh, libertarian philosophy towards uh, free market, so that's good. I mean, anything along those lines and towards that's better than the exact opposite, for sure, especially when you're talking about a government in the first place. Yeah, there's many things about the Chilean government uh, the, and the central bank there that are, aren't that bad. Uh, it's surprising, I know, but uh, <laughs> I don't know it, how long it will last, and it might not you know, last for decades and decades, I don't know. These things always change. As usually the cycle of states is they usually start off quite free because you never start communist. You can't start socialist and communist. You have to have some wealth first. So once uh, they usually start quite free, a lot of wealth is created, and then the socialists and communists and the collective mindset comes in and destroys it all. Uh, so these things do go in cycles, but uh, like uh, we were pointing out earlier, Chile has just recently come off of the communist cycle, and they're back into the capitalist cycle, and they seem to really be taking a, 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 a big control, like they're really grabbing onto it. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of opportunities because um, I was just down and I just interviewed some people from a, a, a new company called Exosphere, and they're uh, starting up basically an entrepreneurial school, trying to teach people how to become entrepreneurs, something you'll never learn in public school or in business school in the U.S. And uh, what they pointed out to me is that they are catching on to capitalism, but hardly anyone even still has a website. There's, you go to a lot of restaurants or, or even hotels, they don't even have a website. So there's a tremendous opportunity as well for people who are capitalist-minded or entrepreneurs uh, to go down there. And actually, Chile has a program called Startup Chile, and I don't like any government program, of course, but this is one of the better ones. It actually tries to attract people to come to Chile and start up a business. So this is the mindset currently going on in Chile, and that's why we've really gravitated down there. What is the, uh, I mean, since we're kind of on the topic of their government there, is... Uh I've talked to, this is one of my opinions about it, and just correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that their government is small enough or whatever, not wealthy enough, I guess, to care about your everyday goings-on. I mean, you guys don't have an NSA down there checking out everybody's emails yeah, they and don't phone have calls TSA, and NSA, text messages and um, all that, right? Yeah, there's, they have hardly any of those three-letter horrible agencies. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's really amazing how, how much better it is. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of funny to talk about it because, obviously, that should be the case. You shouldn't have a CIA. You shouldn't have a uh, 
ATF, uh, NSA, uh, TSA, all these things. These things should be obvious to anyone who's really into uh, free markets or freedom, which a lot of Americans say they they live in the land of the free. That's all brainwashing propaganda, obviously, and especially people are really waking up to it now in the U.S., especially because the police state is coming in so harshly. I just heard uh, just uh, today they're having that Burning Man uh, thing in California, and this is basically an anar anar anarchic uh, event. It's it's they go out to the desert every year and they just there's no no real rules or laws except for don't hurt anybody, and uh, it's very free. And the the police have really cracked down this year. They're, they're, they're actually not even sure if they're going to go through with the event this year because they've got all these checkpoints set up. They're arresting people for all kinds of things, urinating in the desert, uh, all kinds of victimless crimes. Uh, so the U.S. is just, uh, it, I think people are slowly waking up to the fact they don't really live in the land of the free and there's definitely, it's not the land of opportunity anymore, it's the exact opposite. You can't even open a lemonade stand. There's, there's been a new uh, group called uh, uh, something lemonade, uh, free lemonade or something, and they're, they're just trying to open up lemonade stands in different parts of the country and every single time the police show up, people end up in handcuffs. Uh, it's uh, it's really the, the the dark side of the government in the U.S. is finally really showing its teeth to the people in the U.S. and you're seeing that as well with a lot of seniors getting killed by cops now. Uh, the, the the older people and not not to. Uh, I uh, talk poorly about older people at all, but uh, they kind of lived through the good times of the U.S. Uh, they, they lived off of the fat of the socialist system. So when the social security system started, uh, they got all the benefits. It's a giant Ponzi scheme. But all that's falling apart now, and, and it, people are slowly waking up to the fact that everything that they thought the U.S. was, it's not anymore. And it's probably going to get a lot worse before it gets any better. Yeah. I would have to agree with that. Ken, if I could ask you, we're talking about you know, businesses and stuff. We, we've got about two minutes before our break, and then we have a one-minute break. Um, so let's just say a guy wants to go down there to start a business. Is, what are the hurdles? I'm, I've, I mean, I've, I've read the information that you sent me, and I've studied it a little more than maybe our listeners. So just tell us, is, it, is the cost of entry there to start a business or, or whatever that someone wants to do? Is it easier than what maybe we face here in the States or in the Western world right now? Well, uh, you can register yourself. You just walk in with your, it would be your passport from the United States. You walk into the tax office and uh, in a period of about two hours and you can start economic activity in Chile as a tourist. You can also buy property and qualify for uh Investor visa, but uh, yeah, to start a business in Chile is is very user friendly. Uh, if you want to build a building, did you say two hours? Uh, yeah, you're kind of cutting in and out there, Ken. Fifteen. While you're okay, we are. Yeah, oh, two hours to inscribe the business. Two hours. I, I think I spent two hours at DMV last week just to, to try <laughs> just to, get to, my, register a car. to get my permission to continue to do a completely legal activity as long as I, yeah, two hours. Pay for it. Holy smokes. And you said that that's even for a an outsider. I mean, not even a citizen there. A tourist. That a tourist can start you a business. Can come in as a tourist and you can do that. I believe you can start a Chilean corporation over the internet in one day now. They just instituted that recently. <laughs> well, I think I might start a Chilean right. business on the internet just to say I have one. <laughs> I don't think I could get a business here. <laughs> the, the cost of a business license alone just to do business inside the city of Fairbanks is, what, $150 now? Oh, it's, uh, it, it goes based off what, you, what your earnings are. It's basically an income tax oh, to the oh, city. Oh, what? All right, gentlemen, hang on the phone with us here. We've got the Fox News indoctrination, and then we'll be back with more of our One of Patriots Women. We like to call it the Saturday morning wake-up call on Local Talk Radio, KFAR. This is KFA. And welcome back to Patriots Lament. This is our one. We'd like to call it the Saturday morning wake-up call because we'd like people to wake up to the fact that we do not have the civil liberties that we used to have here in this country. We'd like people to wake up to the fact that uh, freedom is an idea that has been, well, I guess you could say bastardized maybe here in this country. Yeah. And, and so we are, we're finding that some of our favorite people are people who have left 
<laughs> this country and uh, other countries like it, like uh, Canada, and have gone down there to uh, Chile to Galt's Gulch, and that's why we've got on the phone with us today Jeff Berwick. Jeff, you still there? Yes, sir. And we've also got uh, Ken Carpenter, who actually is in Chile as we speak. Ken, are you there? Yes, sir. All right, wonderful. Sure. We had some issues uh, right before the uh, bottom of the hour with our telephones and uh, kind of cutting in and out. Are you guys Skyping, or are, what kind of phone systems are you using down there? Yeah, I'm on Skype in Acapulco, Mexico, and I think Ken is as well in Chile. Right, outstanding. Technology. I, lo I love it. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't have done this program five years ago hmm. from, yeah. from, from Chile and, and from Mexico. Just it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have happened. We did not have the technology. Yeah, that's true. So for people that are just coming in right now, we've got uh, these two guys on to, you know, Steve was just opened up with how the freedoms in the U.S. are rather gone. And so <laughs> we're basically saying, hey, there's some options here. And, you know, even, I can even speak for myself. It's hard to think of moving away because, you know, we got our homes. You know, I've lived in Fairbanks for like 10 or 11 years now, something there. And, you know, we have friends. You have your day-to-day -day activities that you do every day that you're, you're stuck with. You have your businesses. You have all these things that they're just hard to break away from. And can you guys speak to that a little bit? What... How hard is it to just finally get yourself to just do it? I mean, you guys offer to just come down and visit, correct? Just come down and visit, check it out, see how things are, and just, like like Ken said earlier, just maybe you just want a vacation place. Might be good to have if you need to bug out, just to have a vacation place in Chile. Yeah, I definitely recommend that. Um, talking to your earlier point, and, and, and that's totally correct. Uh, if you want to come down to Chile, you just contact Ken Carpenter. You can just go to GaltzGoldsChile.com, and you get through to Ken or uh, any of our other people there. And we're very happy to help people out, tell them uh, where the best places to stay are, what's the best restaurants, and, and uh, tour them around the property, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but uh, to your earlier point about how hard it is to break away, it's going to be a lot easier to do it right now <clears throat> than it will be in the next few years. It's better to do it now and just bite the bullet. Uh, and I'm not trying to be a fear monger here. I truly believe this. I, I spend most of my time in my life researching this information for the Dollar Vigilante. And I really believe that the U.S. is going to go into incredibly bad circumstances in the next few years. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, gates being put up, all kinds of hurdles so that people can't leave. Uh, there's a thing called FATCA. They're trying to make it so no American can even open a bank account or a brokerage account anywhere on earth outside of the U.S. That comes into effect in July of next year. Uh, basically what the U.S. government is doing is threatening any country that allows uh, U.S. people to have a bank account or a brokerage in their country that they'll come after them and, and basically shut them down. Black helicopters will come in. This is a typical uh, uh, threats from the U.S. government. Uh, and all those sort of things are coming into effect. And you just saw last year with uh, Edward Sabra on Facebook, he left uh, to save himself about a billion dollars in capital gains taxes. Or, or uh, we don't know exactly why he left, but I bet that was a part of the reason. <laughs> it's and a good reason. <laughs> yeah. And he, he actually wasn't even American. He was born in Brazil, but he became an American or had a green card or something like that. I think he even had a passport. And he left right before the Facebook IPO, and he be renounced his citizenship and became a Singaporean uh, citizen, which doesn't have capital gain taxes. And the U.S. government was so enraged that one of their tax cattle had escaped the farm that they actually instituted a an act called the Anti-Expatriation Act, which is still winding its way through the slimy halls of Congress. And if that doesn't wake people up, that they're trying to pass an act that's called Anti-Expatriation Act. In other words, you can't leave act. <laughs> Uh, Once an American, always an American, <laughs> damn it! <laughs> That's right. They fought for your freedoms, now you got to stay and deal with them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you are free to stay <laughs> and pay your taxes. Home of the fee, land of the slave. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, so it's going to be much easier to uh, bite the bullet now. Well, the capital co controls haven't come fully into effect, and th those will be more in effect every uh, year now. What, like I said, FATCA comes into effect next year. It's already basically in effect. Many banks and brokerages and even uh, gold storage facilities around the world are turning away American clients right now. So the doors are starting to close. 
Uh, so I would take this opportunity, while the, the economy still appears to be alive and doing well, uh, to uh, try to sell your business, try to sell your assets in the U.S., and try to internationalize at least some of them. I'm not saying everyone's uh, situation is different, obviously, and you don't have to panic and do it tomorrow. But definitely, the sooner you do it, the easier it's going to be, and the more you're going to save, because as the U.S. dollar collapses and as the U.S. government collapses, uh, it's going to take down most of their citizens' wealth with it because most of that wealth is in places like banks, which will all collapse. They're all insolvent. Um, and just like we saw in Cyprus, Cyprus, uh, the, the finances in the banking system in Cyprus is not much different than the U.S. In fact, the U.S. in many ways is worse. The only reason the U.S. hasn't collapsed yet is because people still accept the U.S. dollar around the world, but that is very quickly fading away. We're seeing regions like South America that are just, uh, because the U.S. is becoming less and less of an econ economic powerhouse over time, uh, people are stopping uh, listening to them as much as they used to. In, in the old days, the U.S., especially after World War II, it was the only economic powerhouse st still standing. But now the rest of the world's growing tremendously, Asia, China, uh, even Russia, uh, all the, again, the ex-communist places are all booming now. And m many people are just uh, starting to shun uh, the American government and the U.S. dollar. And, and we actually saw this month for the first time ever, foreigners sold every single asset class in the U.S. They sold stocks, they sold bonds, they sold treasury uh, bonds. Uh, every single asset class was a massive sell-off, and that's why interest rates uh, rose, the uh, shorter term and longer term interest rates rose fairly significantly in the last few months. It's because the foreigners are starting to leave the U.S. now, too, and it's going to just snowball from here. You know, you and I talked the other day, and one of the things that we were talking about was one way or the other, people are going to get kicked out of their comfort zone. It's just going to mm -hmm. happen. So you might as well do it on your own terms, at least some of your own terms, and have a little bit of decision mm -hmm. of how that comfort zone's being kicked out from under you, instead of waiting for the, the box just to be kicked and you go crumbling down. Yeah, sometimes I feel like I'm talking to a Jewish person in 1941 and just mentioning they might want to start making plans to leave Germany. Uh, it's really, it, I don't know if we're going to get to concentration camps and that sort of thing, but they already have basically concentration camps in the U.S., the prisons. There's millions of people in cages, rape camps and work camps uh, for victimless crimes. They didn't uh, do a crime against anyone and uh, the U.S. has 5% of the world population and 25% of the prison population. So all of these things, the propaganda does a really good job of fooling people. They think, oh, that, that's good, we have uh, all these laws and all these people in jail. Uh, they, they've really uh, advanced the propaganda to the point that a lot of people still, unfortunately, don't see it. But the U.S. is just becoming one of the worst places on earth to be. I, if I had to pick three countries on earth that I wouldn't want to be in for the next few years, number one would be North Korea. Uh, number two, maybe Cuba, although you can have some fun in Cuba still, and it's actually getting better now. Uh, and probably number three is the U.S. I just don't want to be around there. It's, it's turning into, a, and it will get worse and worse. And I'm not trying to scaremonger here. And of course, many of your listeners are in Alaska, and hopefully it's a little bit better up there. I haven't been up there in a long time. but. Uh, it, a lot of the continental U.S., especially places like California and New York, you can just see them falling apart, uh, especially as a person who, who doesn't live there. Of course, when you live there, it's sort of like a, a frog in a boiling pot of water. It kind of happens slowly over years, and you don't see the changes. It's sort of like when you, you uh, leave your young child for six months and you come back and you really recognize the changes, whereas if you had been living with them the whole time, you wouldn't recognize it. Uh, for someone like me who lives outside of the system, I, I live most of my time in Mexico in Chile, uh, is uh, I can just see the uh, dramatic changes happening all the time in the U.S. and and it's going to be much easier to get out uh, in the next year or two than it will be after that. And I really urge people to at least make some plans. At least get some of your assets outside of the U.S. Give yourself some options. Can I can I ask a couple of quick questions about that? Um, it, what if you're somebody like me who doesn't really have any assets? I mean, I, I quote, own a home, but I've, I'm mortgaged. So even if I were to sell my home right now, I wouldn't be able to put it into a, you know, I'd be able to <laughs> basically put all of my assets into a suitcase. And, and that would be it. Uh, for somebody like that, and I know there are a lot of folks up here who are in a similar situation, would it be worth it to just go to Chile and try to m make it? Or, I mean, I, kind of what keeps you from moving in a situation like that is fear. What would I do to make a living? What would I do, you know, I wouldn't have a place to live because I don't have the money to buy a house there. 
Yeah, there's, uh, it's, a, it's definitely difficult. And, um, but I'd like to point out that the people who arrived at Ellis Island in New York about 100 years ago, the average person arrived mostly from Europe uh, with, in today's dollars, $90 in their pockets. Many of them didn't have shoes, they didn't speak English, uh, but they were going to a place where they had a chance to succeed. And I really, especially for younger people, uh, because it's a lot easier for them, uh, and it, uh, what, what I'd like to tell uh, parents uh, who have uh, younger uh, children who are maybe college age, don't send them to college, save that money, perhaps put some of it into, uh, uh, give them a, a ticket to somewhere like Chile or Hong Kong or Singapore or Mexico, anywhere. Uh, that's a the much better education and there's much more uh, chance of opportunity in a lot of those places than there is in the U.S. right now. Even if you uh, went through all of college in the U.S. and you, once you get out you're going to find there's really no jobs. Uh, right now it's very difficult and it's going to get worse and worse. So you might as well start the process now. Take a chance. It's not easy uh, but just like the founding fathers of the U.S. it wasn't easy for them. They had, they literally when they, they uh, tried to separate from the England, uh, it was a, as you guys know very well, it was not easy. They were being tortured and, and uh, just chased all over the place, but they fought for freedom. And I, I think a lot of people today are just, have been lulled into this sense of uh, you know, security and they actually are scared, especially because of the media and the government constantly telling them that the world's a dangerous place. And they do that on purpose to keep you there. Um, but if you have the opportunity or if you can just even, if you have $10,000, uh, find some sort of cheap flight, go to Mexico or Chile, uh, and uh, we actually have groups at, at the Dollar Vigilante. If you go to dollarvigilante.com and you sign up for our newsletter, we have TDD groups, which is basically freedom-minded groups. All over the world, we have over 40 countries now, I believe, and many in, in Chile, many in Mexico, there's a lot in Mexico, all over the place in Asia and all over the world, and these are people who you can actually just talk to, and, they, and many of them want to help like-minded people. And many of them are entrepreneurial and capitalist, and they actually have their own businesses in those countries already as an expat. And many of them are looking for people uh, who want to work and want to help them out. And especially uh, because, like I mentioned earlier, places like Chile and a lot of these countries, even Mexico, the people haven't really caught on to entrepreneurialism very much. So uh, the Americans have a huge advantage in a number of things. One, they speak English, which is still the world's most used language in terms of business and in terms of almost anything on the internet. That's the main language used. Uh, and they also understand, they still have an understanding of entrepreneurship and capitalism, uh, although it's fading and, and, and it's definitely a, a a bad environment in the U.S. and going to get worse, they actually have that understanding, whereas in a lot of these other countries which are developing now, they don't have that understanding. So you can just walk in and you'll be of use to someone almost instantly, but you have to just take a chance and, and figure it out. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be a lot easier to do this than to stick around for five years in the U.S. and, and I'm not sure what's going to happen, but it's not going to be pretty. A lot of... Wait, just a second. What, what might get you on over there, Aaron? I don't know this one. There you go. I got you. A lot of Jews walked into concentration camps with just a suitcase. <laughs> nice. <laughs> After the state took everything that they had. Well, they had they had the opportunity to go earlier and didn't and ended up with nothing anyway. Right. You're basically looking at the same choice. What if you have but, a, but if, you gentlemen, if you gentlemen are doing economic activity in the United States and you're supporting occupation of half the world with the United States military. That was my main thing. I just can't support that. I don't want to have a war against Cuba for 50 or 60 years. You know, I, I would rather see these people be able to trade with the people in Miami, their, their family, you know? Yeah, my thing is I just have to, I have to remove myself from, from economic activity that is supporting a non-peace activity. Tell us a little bit about that. What's, uh, what is the environment in Chile as far as their their government armed forces are they in Afghanistan, Iraq, and uh, Yemen, Pakistan? Are they out there warmongering, or as far as I know, there there aren't Chilean soldiers outside of Chile. I mean, there might be some some have trained in uh, on bases in the United States that went to school, different military schools in the states. Uh, I have friends who have done that as well, work in the Navy, but no, I, I don't know that there are Chilean soldiers anywhere. But you like. That's just because they don't believe in spreading democracy. <laughs> <laughs> well, they hate us for our freedom. Yes, of course they do. <laughs> so what the, um, I think, I don't, I don't know if my numbers are right, but I think their total armed forces is somewhere, Mike, I think you and I looked at that, somewhere around 50,000 
people total in their whole armed forces? I mean, when's the I last? Think there's, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's 40,000 uh, police officers in New York City alone, and <laughs> actually, uh, uh, Nanny Bloomberg uh, has a quote saying that, or one of the one of the top New York officials said, uh, these street gangs uh, have you know a hundred people or a thousand people. My gang has 30,000 people. Just goes to show their mindset. Yeah, no kidding. And you guys down there, there's not. Uh, I'm sure we would know in the states if something was happening like this, but you don't have these terrorist things going on. That, I mean, what's the, what is the uh, mindset there as far as terrorism? I mean, I imagine your local that lives there probably doesn't think much about the goings on of Osama bin Laden. Right? Do they think that if we're not over there killing them, they'll be over here on their goats? Yeah, I'll let Kim answer that question, but I'll just briefly chime in that here in Mexico, no one cares at all. Uh, y you never hear about a plane getting hijacked and they start killing all the Chilean people or all the Mexican people. When you th All these terrorist supposed things are all caused by the actions of the U.S. government. They're a self-licking ice cream cone. They go and they, they uh, stir up... Uh, th they've attacked over 100 countries, I believe, in the last 100 years, and they've been involved in all sorts of coups and regime changes, all CIA based and that creates a lot of people who get very angry there's people just last week uh, a school was drone bombed in I believe Syria uh, numerous children killed uh, that turns makes people fairly angry that would make me quite angry I would say and uh, so what that is the cause of so-called terrorism and actually most of the terrorist acts on earth are actually committed by the US government itself including places like the biggest terrorist attack ever in Japan Hi Hiroshima and Nagasaki they uh, nuclear bombed a city full of men women and children uh, in killing hundreds of thousands of people uh, and people just don't see it they, they've been so brainwashed into thinking thinking that the U.S. government is fighting for freedom, but it's really the biggest terrorist organization on earth, and there's a lot of blowback, as Ron Paul always says. And uh, Ken can definitely comment on, on what's the attitude in Chile towards terrorism. Yeah, you know, I don't even, you don't even hear the word spoken. It's terrorismo, but you don't even hear it. Uh, you know, of course, the, the news from the States makes it into the papers here and on the news, but it's, uh, you know, they, they talk about Syria, and they talk about different things on the news in Egypt. But uh, here, people are just trying to trying to go about their daily lives, and uh, family is very important. Uh, it, it's just not a you know, there's it's not sensationalized. It, it's not a punchline every day on every news show about how how scared you need to be living around here, how you need your protectors. It's not like that. People here, uh, you know, they're they're ready to do their barbecues and. They have great wine in Chile. Uh, we have. They don't even uh, advertise organic food because all of it's organic. You know, it's all small farms. It's all. It's all done in a, a very ecological manner, especially in our valley. So, that's what we're about. We want to. We want to give people good food and and uh, let them live peacefully and trade amongst each other. And that's what Gulf Gulch is all about. Yeah, tell us some more because we're getting pretty close to the top of the hour. Tell us some more things about your place there. Just. Uh, if you want the size, and you were talking about, you know, I've, I've read up on it, so, but tell us about your water systems, and I believe you guys are going to have your own power system to generate electricity. Well, and uh, We would like to do that, and we're, we're investigating different ways to do that uh, with the, the, smallest, the smallest footprint. So we might do that using water and uh, catching, uh, catching the gravity-fed hydropower from uh, different areas within Gulf Gulch. It's, the area encompasses 11,000 square, uh, 11,000 square acres. So uh, we're, we're talking about a big area that has 6,000 foot mountain peaks surrounding it. Uh, it's in a, its own, it's got its own water capture system. It's a large mountain basin. And uh, where Gulf Gulch is pulls, pulls a great amount of this water. Uh, Gulf Gulch has all the water rights. It has a, a great flow of water, a huge aquifer. And uh, on one of our tours just uh, two weeks ago, I had a, a girl that was two months pregnant. She goes down and she, right from the river, pulls out a, a quart of uh, a plastic bottle and fills it up with water and drinks it. But it's just, it's a perfect unmolested water supply. And it's going to really help us uh, move forward with our farming and diversity in farming and and be able to, to offer great food in a safe environment 
uh, for people who voluntarily want to be there and trade trade with one another. That's fantastic. And you were saying that uh, I think you were saying that uh, just for people who recognize these names, that, that uh, Tom Woods is going to be coming down to visit you guys here soon. Uh, I haven't confirmed that. That uh, we have a uh, Tatiana Morose is our marketing and media person. She arranges those things, so uh, I, I send out the news when it's uh, when it's confirmed. But we haven't confirmed uh, the actual guest yet. But we have a lot of exciting things that could be happening at, in Golf Gulch, and we'll be uh, releasing news releases when those happen. Yeah, people need to follow the. You'll put those things on your website, right? GolfGulchChile dot com. Yes, yes, and uh, and we'll send out. Uh, Newsletters. We have uh, Gary Gibson coming down here uh, starting next week. He's going to write the newsletter for Golf School Chile. Yeah, he's bugging out, right? He's on his way. Right on. <laughs> so and Wendy McElroy, who's another fairly well-known oh, yeah. libertarian, she's uh, bought a place at Golf School. I was just talking to Stefan Molyneux, and I don't want to uh, uh, give too much away on his private information, but he's quite interested in getting down there. <laughs> so there's a lot of people really gravitating that they just uh, believe in freedom, and they just have had enough of this Western. Uh, governments and, and Stefan and Wendy are actually both Canadian, but Canada is very similar to the U.S. nowadays. Uh, they're, they're involved in almost all the wars that the U.S. gets involved in, uh, and all those sort of things, and getting more militarized uh, and, and the police as well. So, yeah, there's so many people that are just uh, had enough and they're they're heading south. Has the government, uh, the local government, there come to check you guys out? I mean, like we have. I just saw this thing the other day where. It, uh, where the Free State Project is there in New Hampshire, the local sheriff was asking for armored vehicles and tanks, I believe. I might be wrong about the tanks, but anyways, to take care of these non-aggressor, non-aggressor libertarians and the Free State Project, which is just a joke. I mean, they don't, they've never had any incident with any of the Free Staters there, but yeah, they, just the fact that they're free, that they want to be free is what they don't like, but has the, have you guys been in contact? I mean, surely the local government there knows that you guys have the land, do they know your plans there, are they supportive of that, or, or the just... indication, yeah, go ahead, Kim. Yeah, uh, we're making relationships with all those ministries, uh, especially the environmental ministries, uh, the public works in our local township of Kirkaby, as well as the forestry ministry, because as we make changes to the land, we want to actually improve the environment. Uh, we want to have more vegetation. We want to have a healthier environment than what we started with. So, uh, yeah, we're we're, uh, we're integrating into the Chilean landscape, not vice versa. We're not imposing ourselves on it. So we have families, uh, you know, generational families who we've become close friends with and uh, both Chileans and, and foreigners that are going to be here. So it's, it's it's a very peaceful it's a very peaceful existence, and it's a pro business climate. You know, so they're they're happy to have us. They're happy to have our economic activity as well. Yeah, speaking of economic activity, if for people who don't know, you can go to the Heritage Institute, and Heritage actually has Chile as the number seventh most free economic state in the world with America at 10 and some other other websites have it at 13 and the arrow the little arrow showing which way they're going is always down on the US and Chile right now according to the Harris Institute is at 7 and its arrow is up and one of the things that I thought was really interesting looking into this is that uh, the property rights which I think is so important to have a free society is to have strong private property rights which Property rights should mean everything about you, but the Chile itself has very strong property rights, even for foreigners. Even if you don't live there, whatever, if you own property, they have they protect your property. Your property rights are secure, which used to be something that happened here in the states, and now it's just yeah, right, not so much. Yeah, all of those freedom indexes, I really laugh at too, because uh, talking about property rights, when you're living in the U.S. and your uh, property taxes for your house every year is ten thousand dollars a year, <laughs> you don't own that house. You're renting. No, you're exactly right. <laughs> well, that's a good point to bring up too. What what uh, I've heard mixed things, and I never actually got a, a, a straightforward answer, maybe, or just didn't understand. Two I've, minutes. I've heard that uh, Santiago itself has property taxes, but outside most places like farm grounds, not taxed. Yeah, that's, it's not it's not taxed until you build a structure on it. 
and then it's uh, it's between one and one point four percent of the assessed of your home of your structure on that property. So the wow. farmland itself is, is not is not taxable though. No. Right. Okay. Well, we're winding down here, guys. You want to give uh, just any last minute? What do we have, Steve? A, a minute? Or? We have about a minute and a half to, to do all of the contact information. Whatever websites or addresses, phone numbers, whatever you guys want to give to get us in contact with you. Yeah, go for it. So I have www.golfsgoldschile.com. Uh, Facebook site, a lot of pictures. Our website is currently expanding, too. It's... Uh, we're building on it and adding more photos and more maps and interactive features. So, GolfSportsChile.com. All right. Right on. Well, we hope that uh, people listening will tune in and check you guys out. And like you guys have said a couple times, they're more than welcome to get in contact with you guys. Come visit. Come see what's going on. Get out. <laughs> I like the way you compared it to Ellis Island. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, so... Jeff uh, Berwick, thank you again, man. You've always been gracious to come on our show. I know you're a busy guy. And Ken Carpenter from Chile. And, folks, check these guys out. And, by the way, Jeff Berwick's site is uh, dollarvigilante.com. That's right, yep. I want to make sure we give you the love. Thank you, gentlemen, for being on with us here today on Patriots Lament. Hour one here, Saturday morning wake up call. Our, our contact information is patriotslament.blogspot.com and our email is patriotslament at gmail.com. And on YouTube, the Radio channel. Free Fairbanks. All right, and this will be posted there sometime in the near future. It'll also be posted on our website, kfar660.com. And we're going to be sending a copy, including video today, yep. down to Jeff Berwick.